you, you write uh, on your blog that there are four basic principles that you observe to be involved in, in the creation of a life well lived. Balance, awareness, practice, and wisdom. You've already talked to, to all of these. So um, let's, um, let's take them one more time, one by one, and, and anchor me, please, in your core idea, core thinking. First about balance, which you talk to now in the idea of bringing life energies into balance. What, what else would you say to a young person who would say, who would ask you, how can I live a more balanced life? What, what would be the guidance that you offer? That's really a, an important question. Um, you know, life is energy and um, physicists would say this. And, um, and when that energy is not in balance, we experience dis hyphen ease disease. And we can tell when we're not in balanced, we're not balanced when we're stressed or we're quick to anger, or sometimes even when we get sick, we're, we're, we're not balanced. And so I think balance, you know, is critically important and it's the uh, body, mind, spirit. And the thing that uh, frustrates me, and, and it's a difficult thing to approach, is that when you invoke the word spirit, people immediately think religion. And increasingly, especially young people, I think there was a recent Pew survey that said something around 40% of young people do not observe religion in a formal way. And if someone connects to spirit, the religion, that's wonderful, but that's not what I'm talking about. When I speak to religion, I'm speaking to that in-betweenness Hmm. That in between this is between you and a friend, you and a lover, you and nature, you and your God. Uh, it's in between this. And so when we're balancing spirit, what we're balancing, what we're saying is this isn't all about me. It's about us and us with a big you. And it's learning to see and participate in the grand big E ecology of life. That's what spirit's about. And so when I say balancing mind, body, and spirit, it's, you know, get your get yourself in shape. It doesn't mean you're not a little overweight. I've always been a little overweight. Um, my running friends called me the Clydesdale. <laughs> but uh, but it's, it's learning to, you know, discipline your body and discipline your mind and open up your being to the spirit that is all around us. So that's the balance part. What was the, uh, the second one was? Well, you're already in what you described now. Uh, in the way you describe spirit, you already talk about awareness and about practice as the two pathways that you must uh, integrate to the idea of, of balance. Because if you are to be balanced, then you, you've got to practice awareness about it and about what you call the in-betweenness. The, f- the fourth element is wisdom. How do you, again, ground wisdom in this idea of the four basic principles of a life well lived? Would you mind if I went back for a second to awareness? Please. Because you and I, I think, uh, resonate uh, with awareness. I mean, I knowing a little bit about you, Aviv, I know that uh, when I speak of awareness, it's not something that you find to be foreign. But um, amongst um, some of my more scientific friends and uh, um, uh, the strict materialists, uh, um, you know, awareness, you know, what are you talking about, Tim, awareness? Of course, we're aware. I mean, there's a, a large uh, group of people, maybe a majority of people, that um, think the discussion of awareness is um, either pedantic or just a waste of time, because after all, that's what we are. And one of the key themes of my blog is awareness, while it's innate, it's very much a cultivatable skill. And it's a skill we can spend our life cultivating. And um, so, first of all, that's, the, that's kind of the awareness piece. Now, to get back to how you find wisdom, I think wisdom finds us when we're aware. Because after all, somehow, and according to scientists, and I have no reason to believe this isn't true, but you know, we're constructed of atoms that uh, were birthed in nuclear fusion and stars, you know, <laughs> way far away. And suddenly, you know, billions of years later, we're here. So, I mean, there's things going on that we have no idea about. 
And there's a wisdom in, in reality that we cannot know. But what I've found is that when I make myself present or when I practice presence, maybe as a better way to describe that, that wisdom, um, wisdom just kind of bubbles up in a, like an artesian force. And to be clear, I mean, like there's a huge difference between knowledge and wisdom. Sometimes I hear people use them interchangeably, but knowledge is something we get when we read a lot and take a lot of notes and take tests and all that stuff. Wisdom is insight with respect to connections. Wisdom is insight with respect to connection. Yeah, wisdom is all about connections. Jimi Hendrix supposedly said, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. And I think when you're present, that's what you're doing, you're listening, and wisdom emerges from that listening. The other element you focus on in your blog is belonging. What is belonging? Another good question. I, I, I should have anticipated all these questions of you <laughs> since they're about the blog, but I, I think um, meaning is us trying to fit in. Where do I fit in? Belonging is where others want us to fit in. So it's almost looking through both ends of the telescope. Meaning is me searching out and going, where do I fit? And belonging is when I feel and when I can see others want me to be a part of them. And um, we haven't talked about this, and I don't, I don't think, I, um, but I, I mentioned it kind of early on in my blog, but I think there's five energies in life. And uh, the first energy is ego. And we all experience this. I mean, when, when a tremendously egotistical, maybe a pathological, easy, egotistical person enters a room, they suck every ounce of energy out of, out of everyone else towards them. That's the first energy. The second energy, um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi wrote a book called Flow. Um, and uh, the second energy is when you immerse yourself in an activity. It might be painting a picture or playing an instrument or whatever it may be, but you're so immersed, you lose track of time, you lose track of presence, hours pass by because you're in flow. Um, uh, uh, the third energy is resonance. And uh, the best way to describe resonance is um, next to my piano um, sits my acoustic guitar. And if I hit the E note on the piano very hard and put my ear next to my guitar, my E string is vibrating. So something happened here that caused something to happen here. And when we become present, really, it's just a facility of opening ourselves to resonant energy, resonant energy. Um, the fourth is radiance. Um, I once knew, um, for a brief period of time, I attended a church in our neighborhood, and there was this minister um, named Gordon, and he was one of the few charismatic people, and I mean seriously charismatic people I've ever met in my life. He was so charismatic that if he walked into the room, I felt better, even if he didn't look at me. He just had this, and, and I studied him and studied him and took notes about him going, why is this person so charismatic? And the only thing I could come to was he had radiant energy. It was the opposite of the egotistical person who sucks the energy out of the room. He gave energy to the room so ubiquitous, ubiquitously that you felt it, even though he wasn't you know, focused specifically on you. The last one is the most subtle, the hardest to understand, and I don't really pretend to understand this energy, but... I have no doubt that it exists. It's manifestation. And when we are, you know, when we are fully participating in a resonant and radiant way, synchronicities occur that are just kind of hard to explain by chance. Um, and, you know, this has happened so many times in my life. Um, I can go back in my journal and see it. That I'm kind of going, you know, that spooky thing that happened just can't be coincidence because it happens all the time. And I think what it might be, 
although there's no way to know really, is that when we are deeply attempting to connect with the world, we send out a radiant energy that has implications. And sometimes those implications bounce back at us. And we experience those as a synchronicity when in fact, it's the give and the take of energy with the world. So that might sound a little woo, <laughs> but, but I, I, think, I think there's something there. You're describing that when you are engaged and connected with the resonant and the radiant aspect of life, to think something is to cause it to be, to, to feel something is to bring it into the manifest realm because you are joined to something bigger and greater than yourself. And that sense of tetheredness inside that greater source becomes therefore a, a, a cosmology of possibility where you are no longer thinking your own so thoughts, just feeling your own feelings. You, you become that conduit of manifestation. Well put. It's, maybe it's Richard Feynman's, the uh, great you know, a teacher, physicist, you know, the multiple, you know, multiple realities. I mean, a couple examples that, are, that just, just blew me away. I was in New Zealand and uh, my daughter was doing a, a semester away in New Zealand. And whenever I'm in a town, I, I immediately find, you know, the bookstore that has the old dusty shelves. And, and um, Dunedin, New Zealand had one of these and uh, those rooms and rooms and rooms, uh, you know, books piled to the ceiling. And I walked into this bookstore and like going through a corn maze without pausing, I went through this maze of rooms, reached up at the end of the one room, almost out of reach, pulled out a book. And it was the exact subject that I had been doing philosophical research on and trying to understand. And I'm going, man, that's strange. And another time in uh, Moab, Colorado, I was in another bookstore. And I'd been, this was before Amazon when rare books were hard to find. And um, lo and behold, this book I'd been looking for for a couple of years was there, you know, on the, on the bookshelf. So I pulled it off and walked up to the checkout counter to pay for it. And the woman at the checkout counter said, oh, this is a very good book. Maybe someday you'll write a book like this. You know, so it, which is right what I was in the process of doing. So I'm kind of going, oh, that's strange. I mean, what kind of vibe did I give off that would make her? And, and the book was a rather esoteric book, you know. So anyway, so I mean, these things happen. And I think we all experience them. And usually we blow them off as artifacts of chance. But I think there's less chance in them than we may appreciate. Circling back to this idea of belonging. You also say that belonging is to be accepted and valued just the way we are. And it's a striking definition because so many people try to be something other than who they are. And, and perhaps um, some of the suffering and struggle and, and strife that accompanies life is, is in through this idea or through this experience of a not being accepted but first not accepting yourself what would you say to that from your observation and experience oh it's so true i mean do you remember the very first time you ever asked you know someone out on a date um i remember the first time i did and you know, it was back in the day of dial phones because I'm old enough to have lived in that day and your hands kind of shaking as if you, you know, as you, as you dial the number and, you know, she answers and you're kind of going, you know, you're, <laughs> you know, and what, where's the fear coming from? Well, of course the fear is, well, what if she says no? And well, you know, now we'd say, well, she said no, but then we said, well, then I would be shattered. Because, you know, because I have mustered all this courage to do this thing. And, and uh, now uh, I've been rejected or, you know, when I first started sharing my writing, you know, I didn't want to share because I didn't think it was any good. And now, you know, it's offered such a way to connect with so many friends I haven't seen 10, 15 years. And whenever I run across a friend, I'm saying, hey, I read your blog every week. In fact, you know. I get my coffee and the first thing I do on Sunday morning is I open your blog and I'm kind of going, 
wow, that's cool. And so I went from, you know, being afraid to even share it with someone to having people I care about being that, that being an important part of their week. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're afraid to put ourselves out there. And, and it's a shame because at the end of the day, you know, who are we trying to impress? We're just trying to be, you know, and, and I think if we let ourselves be sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes <laughs> it's a good lesson to learn if we can. The other interesting thing about the word belong, because you, you have been professionally a very sophisticated investor and actually developed in your company a way to manage assets the, in, in a sophisticated manner. And if you look at the word belong, it says be long. Uh, and, <laughs> Not be short, be long. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and, and so I, I wonder what could that reveal to us about the idea of belonging because in, in that space of life, you can either be short or you can be long. And part of how you choose when you go long and when you go short determines ultimately wh- where you are and, and wh- what, what belongs to you and what are you part of. So I, I wonder if your mind would do anything with that. Yeah, it's, it's a, I had never thought of that before, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting way um, to think about it. I mean, I guess when we're short with ourselves, we miss out a lot, don't we? And we, we often are short with ourselves. Uh, um, you know, we're afraid to put ourselves out there. We're afraid to let, sometimes we're afraid to let the inner part of us um, show. Um, I know in this um, eclectic society that we have this discussion group I reference further, quite frequently, people will be describing their views on a subject and begin to weep because the subject is meaningful to them. And yet, you know, how many times do adults allow themselves to, you know, to weep in front of another adult? I mean, it's something like it's a horror of horrors, right? Even at a funeral, you know, when we're given a, you know, or a eulogy for a parent, you know, what do we do? We, we bite our tongue and we clench our fists and we dig our fingernails into our wrists because we try to get through the eulogy without weeping. Well, the strangest thing to do would be to do that, not weep, right? But we cut ourselves short. So maybe, maybe you have something there. <laughs> I think that's interesting. 